please turn in your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. It is an honor and joy to preach to you this evening. Last week I showed a picture to Pastor John MacArthur. The picture is of Pastor John and my wife, who's sitting down here, and me, standing right in front of this pulpit almost 20 years ago while we were on our honeymoon. Pastor John was about 65 years old at the time. We honeymooned in San Diego, and this was the first church we met with as Mr. and Mrs. Andy Nacelli. It's good to be back with you, this time with my wife and my four daughters, ages 15, 12, 11, and 6. Well, greetings from John Piper and Bethlehem College and Seminary in Minneapolis. That's where I minister. John Piper is the Chancellor of Bethlehem, where I get to teach systematic theology and New Testament. And when Dr. Nathan Buzenitz invited me to minister in Southern California during the month of January, it was a difficult decision, but it was a mission I decided to accept. (laughs) The temperatures forecasted for Minneapolis today and tomorrow are a high of zero and a low of negative seven or eight. And that does not include wind chill with a feel-like temperature. It's really funny to walk around and seeing you in coats. (laughs) Okay, all right. Well, last week I, I got to teach a course here at the Master's Seminary on Paul's letter to the Romans. And I've added a new illustration for when I teach on Romans. So Romans 121, uh, a sentence there says, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, give thanks to him. So a lack of thanking God the creator is a mark of depravity. So here's the story. Uh, While my wife and I were checking out a Walgreens here in Southern California, I, I noticed that the cashier was wearing a winter coat inside. And I think I was wearing a t-shirt. And I made a remark to her about how much I was loving the weather while visiting from Minnesota. And she replied in a foul mood, I hate this weather. I hate this weather. So let's just say I had a really hard time sympathizing with her. <laughs> All right, well, it's, it's the beginning of a new calendar year. This is the time when many of us resolve to be good stewards of our time and our bodies and our talents, and many of us make New Year's resolutions. Our text in Philippians 3 should encourage us as we seek to honor the Lord this year. Let's begin by praying together, and then we'll turn our attention there. So Father, as we hear your words in Philippians 3, would you please teach us, reprove us, correct us, and train us in in righteousness so that we will be equipped for every good work. Amen. Well, not everyone can be a special warfare operator in the Navy SEALs. SEAL stands for Sea, Air, Land Teams in the United States Navy. You have to make it through over a year of elite testing and training. So first, you have to make it through eight weeks of Naval Special Warfare Preparatory School. And then you have to make it through 24 weeks of BUDS training. BUDS stands for Basic Underwater Demolition for SEALs. And this includes three weeks of orientation and seven weeks of physical conditioning and seven weeks of combat diving and seven weeks of land warfare. And then you have to make it through three weeks of parachute jump school. And then you have to make it through 26 weeks of SEAL qualification training, more advanced tactical training. And if you graduate from that, then you earn a Navy SEAL Trident and get assigned to a SEAL team at Coronado, California, or Little Creek, Virginia, and you begin advanced training for your first deployment. So a week and a half ago, my wife and I were on a boat in the San Diego Harbor, and three boats passed us with six SEALs in each boat, and they were doing some sort of training exercise. Now, I have a Christian friend who's currently a Navy SEAL, and he's been serving that way for over a decade, and I asked him recently if the requirements I just shared with you are correct. And here's how he replied. He said, yeah, that generally generally looks correct. Throughout the years, they've added or subtracted a week to those various phases, but it has oscillated around those timelines since I've been in. I might add that regular Navy boot camp precedes all the other training. It's not the type of hardship many expect. Even though it's easier, 
than what they're expecting later. Most people aspiring to become a SEAL initially think they've made a horrible mistake when they get to boot camp. Tedious, monotonous, silly, has little to no relevance to what they joined for. The unexpectedness and inglorious nature of it are challenging for some people, especially compared to what they signed up for, what they're aspiring to. To all that to say, to successfully become a Navy SEAL requires sacrifice and single-mindedness. Sacrifice and single-mindedness. And this illustrates a principle. If you want to achieve an unusually difficult goal, you must sacrifice and be single-minded. In other words, you have to have a goal and you must press on toward the goal. That's the main idea of our passage. Philippians 3, 12 to 16. Let's read it. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. The main idea of this passage is that we must press on toward the goal. So the title of the sermon is Press On Toward the Goal. According to verse 15, the church as a whole must share Paul's mindset. So I'm gonna summarize Paul's argument with the first person plural, we, instead of the first person singular, I. So let's work through this passage by answering five questions. One question for each verse. First, why must we press on toward the goal? Why? Second, how must we press on toward the goal? Third, what is the goal that we must press on toward? Fourth, who must have this mindset about pressing on toward the goal? And then fifth, what must we do as we press on toward the goal? So let's begin with question one. Why? Why must we press on toward the goal? Verse 12. Paul gives two reasons. Look at the first part of verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. So the word this is in that sentence. Not that I have already obtained this. So if you're reading this, you wanna know what does the word this refer to? And you have to look at the previous sentence, verse 11, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So when Paul says in the next sentence in verse 12, not that I have already obtained this, the word this refers to the resurrection from the dead. And Paul's next phrase in verse 12 clarifies what he means when he says, or am already perfect. So resurrection from the dead, being perfect are two ways of referring to us in our glorified bodies when we no longer sin. We're not there yet. We have not reached that goal yet. We have, have not arrived. We're not perfect, we still sin, we're, we're not at the finish line yet, the race isn't over, so we must press on. That's the first reason that we must press on toward the goal. We haven't reached the goal yet. The second reason is in the second half of verse 12. Look at it. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Once again, we have a word, it, now, what does the word it refer to? I, I press on to make it my own. It refers to the same thing as what the word this referred to, the resurrection from the dead. So Paul says that he presses on toward that goal. Press on here translates the same word that verse six translates a persecutor, persecutor of the church. Before God saved Paul, Paul single-mindedly pressed on to persecute Christ's church. And now that God has saved Paul, Paul single-mindedly presses on to the resurrection from the dead. Why? Well, Paul explains that he presses on toward that goal because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Now when 
did that happen for Paul? When did Christ Jesus make Paul his own? And the answer is, when Paul was on the road to Damascus. That's when Christ took hold of Paul and made Paul his own. You can read about it in Acts 9 and 22 and 26. Now, our conversions weren't on the road to Damascus like for Paul, but the principle is true for us, brothers and sisters. Christ first pursued us and possessed us, so we must press on toward the goal. So the answer to our first question, why must we press on toward the goal, is because we haven't reached the goal yet and because Christ Jesus has already pursued and possessed us. That's why we must press on toward the goal. Question two, how? How must we press on toward the goal? And the answer is in verse 13. Let's read it. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. And we'll, we'll pause in the middle of the sentence there. So again, we have the word it. I do not consider that I have made it my own. Again, that word refers to the same thing as in verse 12, this and it in verse 12, the resurrection from the dead. In other words, Paul's saying here, I haven't reached the goal yet, but I am single-mindedly focused on reaching it. So I just use the word, or the term single-mindedly. What's my warrant for using that term? And you can see it in the phrase, one thing I do. One thing I do. Translations render this in various ways. Uh, one says, I am single-minded. Another says, I focus on this one thing. One thing I do. So how must we single-mindedly focus on reaching the goal? And Paul gives two connected ways, which are like two sides of the very same coin. The first side is by forgetting what lies behind, and the other is by straining forward to what lies ahead. So let's consider each of those ways. First, single-mindedly forget what lies behind. When Paul says in verse 13 that he forgets what lies behind, does that mean that he forgets everything in the past? Well, it can't, it can't mean that because of what he just wrote. Looking back in verses four to six, Paul gives reasons that he could be confident in his past fleshly accomplishments. So in some sense, Paul remembers what lies behind. He doesn't forget everything. He doesn't completely fail to remember it. So there must be another sense in which he forgets what lies behind. To forget what lies behind means that you don't focus on it. You don't pay much attention to it. You don't boast in it. You don't focus on it and value it in a way that leads you to conclude, wow, look at that. Look what I've accomplished. Isn't that something? I have arrived. I've made it. Look how well I've done. The race is over. I can kick back and relax. It's possible, however, to look back to the past in an edifying way, to learn from it, to thank God for his grace in the past. But the past must not be your focus. It's not your identity. And this includes your past life before you became a Christian, like what Paul mentions in verses four to six. And this especially includes your past life as a Christian, the good progress you've made as a Christian. You're not supposed to look back and stare at that and get all, ooh, look at all the good I've done. You're supposed to focus on finishing the race. Here's an illustration. In summer 2022, some of my family climbed to the Sacagawea Peak in Montana with some friends. So we started at a trailhead near the top of the mountain, and I think we climbed about 2,000 feet. So when, when, you're, when you're climbing a mountain, you can get discouraged at how far away the summit is as you climb. And it can be encouraging to briefly look back at how far you've come, because that can spur you to keep on going, keep climbing. But looking back is counterproductive if you admire what you've done with sinful pride or if you despair that you still have so far to go or if it causes you to get vertigo and then you lose your balance. Here's, here's another illustration. When I think about the folly of focusing on what lies behind, I think of a middle-aged man who's a bit out of shape 
and who loves to talk about his great athletic achievements in high school. You know who I'm talking about, the pinnacle of his success as an athlete. Now, it's fine for an older man to tell stories to his children, especially and grandchildren about that. I'm a middle-aged man now, and in a moment, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my athletic career in high school. Uh, so I think it can be done, but it's sad when a grown man's identity is his high school athletic career. It's, it's like he didn't grow up. It, it's immature. So focusing on the past like that can distract you from making progress now. So we must press on toward the goal by single-mindedly forgetting what lies behind. If focusing on something in the past hinders us from obeying Christ right now, then we must forget it. That's one side of the coin. Here's the other side. By single-mindedly straining forward to what lies ahead. One of our joys as Christians is to please God by obeying him. God works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That pleases God. That's Philippians 2.13. We please God by obeying him. Later in this letter, Paul thanks the Philippians for sending him a financial gift, which he calls a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. It's Philippians 4.18. Another passage, Colossians 1.10, says that we must walk in a way that is fully pleasing to God. So here are two practical, specific ways we should strain forward to what lies ahead in a way that pleases God. I'll apply this specifically to children and to fathers. So Paul commands, children, obey your parents in the Lord in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. That's Colossians 3.20. So children, the few of you who are in here, I just found out there's an adventure club, so none of you are listening. Uh, children who are here, are you obeying your parents in everything? That's part of what it means for you to run the Christian race. That's part of what it means for you to single-mindedly strain forward to what lies ahead. One of the ways you run the Christian race right now in a way that pleases the Lord is to obey your parents. That's how you run your race. And then for fathers, Paul commands in Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So fathers, are you provoking your children to anger? One of the ways you run the Christian race is to consistently love your children by disciplining them in a way that does not provoke them to anger. One of the ways you run the Christian race is to enculturate your children with a Christian worldview that sees God's word and God's world in accord with reality. Fathers, that's part of what it means for you to single-mindedly strain forward to what lies ahead. That's how you run your race. I don't enjoy running. Uh, I don't enjoy sprinting. I don't enjoy distance running. But I did run the mile on my high school track team my junior year, living in Boston at the time. I joined the team mainly as a way to discipline my body and force myself to do hard things. And I wasn't very good. Uh, I never won the mile long race at a track meet. I couldn't even break the five minute mark, which means you'll never win. Uh, but I did learn some lessons that transfer to life and that I can share as a sermon illustration. So. Here are, I'll, I'll share seven practices briefly that don't help you when you're running a race. One, it doesn't help to focus on what's behind you. A good runner doesn't stare at what's behind. You can't run as fast as you possibly can run if you're twisting around to stare at what's behind you. Or worse, if you turn 180 degrees and you backpedal, like, like on defense in basketball. It's, it's hard to run as fast. That's also a good way to trip. So at minimum, when you look backwards, you lose your rhythm and you slow your pace. So in a football game, when a cornerback is guarding a wide receiver and trying to match that wide receiver step for step, if the cornerback turns prematurely to locate the ball, the wide receiver gets a step and, 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 and creates distance, separation. So the best cornerbacks know when to look back and when not to, because you can lose a step. So that's number one. Number two, it doesn't help to be proud about how quickly you have run this far. When that happens, you're tempted to ease up and make it easier for others to pass you. Lesson three, it doesn't 
help to be depressed about how slowly you have run thus far. Like, oh, woe is me, I'm such a slow runner, I'm embarrassed to even be in this race. That mindset is a self-fulfilling prophecy to lose. Number four, it doesn't help to wander off course. So if you're running around a football track, stay in the inside lane. Don't run in the outer lanes and obviously don't wander up into the stands and hang out with your friends or meander over to the concession stand and get some popcorn. Stay on the course until you finish the race. Number five, it doesn't help to weigh yourself down. I went through an unusual phase in high school when I always wore five pound ankle weights under my jeans. I thought it would help me for track and cross country. It didn't. Uh, I'm not sure how smart that was, but I wasn't foolish enough to keep my ankle weights on during the race. I took them off for the race. You don't want unnecessary weights to slow you down for the race. Number six, it doesn't help to have a low discomfort threshold. No pain, no gain. If you stop exerting effort whenever you become uncomfortable, then you'll be a terrible runner. In verse 13, the words straining forward translate a word that means to exert oneself to the uttermost stretch out, strain. You can't exert yourself to the uttermost without feeling uncomfortable. The goal in a race is not ease and comfort. The goal in a race is to cross the finish line and win. And lesson seven, it doesn't help to focus on stuff other than reaching your goal. You won't do as well if you stare at your feet. You won't do as well if you stare at the crowd. You won't do as well if you start daydreaming. You won't do as well if you're preoccupied with other pressing matters. You won't do as well if you forget that you're in a race. You won't do as well if when you're in that race, you're not focusing on what's left in the race. That's key is when you're in the race is focus on the rest of the race. Give it everything you've got. Give it your maximum effort. Finish well. Focus on the finish line with tunnel vision. Don't get distracted. Don't let off the gas pedal. Don't coast. Don't focus on what you've accomplished thus far. Run. That's how you win. We, as Christians, must press on toward the goal by single-mindedly forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. As Christians, we do not rest on what we have accomplished thus far. As Christians, we know it's all by God's grace anyway that we've accomplished anything. If we look to the past, it's to remember that God is always faithful. What we must not do is dwell on the past in a way that distracts us from making progress now. Finish the race strong, persevere, keep running. We want to finish the race of life so that we can say with Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I've kept the faith. And I imagine Paul saying that as a runner who's fist pumping as he crosses the finish line. That's how we want to finish the race. So that's how we run the race. That's question two. Now question three, what is the goal that we must press on toward? What's the goal? Verse 14. Verse 14 says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? What exactly is the prize? Well, it's the resurrection from the dead. We saw that back in verse 11. And all that goes with that, including reaching a state of sinless perfection. That final phrase in verse 14 is really tricky to translate, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Some translations say, the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus, or the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus, or I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Those are all helpful translations to get the sense. I think verses 20 and 21 clarify what this goal is. Look at that, verses 20 and 21. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. That's the goal we're pressing on toward. And we'll, we will reach the finish line of our race after we die or when Christ returns, if that occurs first. The prize is what God's upward call promises, our future glorification, so that we'll be like Christ. God's call is upward or heavenly in the sense of Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. So the prize is that God finally saves us from the presence of sin and gives us resurrection bodies in his presence. That's a goal worth single-mindedly sacrificing for, isn't it? That's the goal we should be pressing on toward. The goal is our future sanctification, or what theologians typically call our glorification. So, quick little theological sidebar here. When we hear the, the word sanctification, we typically think of progressive sanctification, like how you live the Christian life. In Scripture, there are three tenses of sanctification, past, present, and future. It's not just present. So the past type of sanctification, you could call definitive or positional sanctification. It occurs simultaneously with conversion and justification. And the present kind is the one we're familiar with, more familiar with, and the future kind is perfect, complete, final sanctification, what we typically refer to as glorification. So you could say, I am, or I have been sanctified, past, I am being sanctified, present, and I will be sanctified, future, past, present, future. God sets a Christian apart from sin's penalty and his old self in Adam, that's past, and God is gradually setting a Christian apart from sin's power and practice, that's right now, present, and in the future, God will set a Christian apart from sin's presence and possibility. So, Three tenses of sanctification. God has saved me from the presence of sin, past. He is saving me right now from the power of sin. And he said, yeah, but I still sin now. So pressing on toward the goal is not working for my salvation. Pressing on toward the goal is working out my salvation. Remember what Paul writes in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So God works in, I work out, I do not work for. So past, present, and then that one day, God will save me from the very presence of sin in the future. That's the prize, that's the goal. And that goal is one that ultimately satisfies us with God himself, because God made us for God. Sadly, most people are spending their lives, wasting their lives, chasing lesser goals. Goals that do not ultimately satisfy. Even if you reach those lesser goals, they leave you feeling empty. For example, the goal of many professional football players is to win a Super Bowl. Not everyone wins a Super Bowl. It's hard enough to become a professional football player it's very hard to win a Super Bowl. That's something that all Minnesota Vikings fans understand. <laughs> to win a Super Bowl requires sacrifice and single-mindedness. But what happens if you do win a Super Bowl? Does that ultimately satisfy you? Let's consider the case of the most decorated professional football player of all time, Tom Brady. He also happens to be my favorite football player. He's now retired. I lived in Michigan from 92 to 94, right before he joined the University of Michigan team, so I've been following him since then. And uh, I've been, uh, I, I think it's uncontroversial to say this. Uh, Tom Brady is the most successful quarterback in NFL history. He started in 10 Super Bowls, and he won seven of them. In 2005, after he won just his third Super Bowl, 60 Minutes interviewed him, and here's what he said. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think 
it's gotta be more than this. I mean, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it, I'm 27, and what else is there for me? And the interviewer asks him, so what's the answer? And he says, I wish I knew, I wish I knew. I mean, I think that's part of me trying to go out and experience other things. I, I love playing football and I love being a quarterback for this team, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find. I know what ultimately makes me happy are family and friends and positive relationships with great people. And I think I get more out of that than anything. Now that's, that's sad, especially since he recently divorced again. I, so I, I enjoyed watching Tom Brady play football because he's a football genius, but I pray that he will find what ultimately satisfies. And that's God himself. There is one ultimate prize that is worth pressing on toward. And it's the prize that Paul highlights in our passage, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Anything else is a lesser goal that will not satisfy. In contrast to Tom Brady, consider John Tipton. You've probably never heard of John Tipton. He didn't play in the NFL. My wife called him Uncle John, even though he wasn't actually her uncle. He, he faithfully served God for many decades in his church in South Carolina mostly behind the scenes by caring for his church's building and meeting all kinds of practical needs and especially for older folks in the church. He encouraged others by highlighting specific evidences of God's grace. He even did some premarital counseling for Jenny and me over 20 years ago. And early in 2022, John Tipton finished his race at age 77. Shortly before he died, he told my father-in-law, I'm just sitting here waiting for the bus. He was ready and eager to meet the Lord. He had pressed on toward the goal and he was taking his final steps to the finish line and he didn't waste his life on weak pleasures. Weak pleasures. So listen to how C.S. Lewis reflects on weak pleasures in his famous essay, The Weight of Glory. Lewis says, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. He goes on to say, the promises of scripture may very roughly be reduced to five heads. It is promised firstly that we shall be with Christ. Secondly, that we shall be like him. Thirdly, with an enormous wealth of imagery, that we shall have glory. Fourthly, that we shall in some sense be fed or feasted or entertained. And finally, that we shall have some sort of official position in the universe, ruling cities, judging angels, being pillars of God's temple. Lewis is right. We are far too easily pleased. We're tempted to press on toward goals that don't ultimately satisfy. The goal, the one goal that we should be single-mindedly pressing on toward is the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That prize is that God finally saves us from the presence of sin and gives us resurrection bodies in his presence. God made us for God. So question three, what is the goal that we must press on toward? It's the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, question four. Who must have this mindset about pressing on toward the goal? Who needs to think this way? Answers in verse 15, let's read it. Let those of us who are mature think this way, that is have this mindset, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Several translations begin verse 15 with the word therefore. That's because the Greek text begins with the word we typically translate as therefore. I'm not sure why some translations like the ESV and NIV don't include the word therefore there. I didn't look at the Legacy Standard Bible. Does it say therefore there? Yes, there you go, good. Okay, so the point is that 
But verse 15 is an inference. So because verses 12, 13, 14 are true, therefore, verse 15 logically follows. That's how it works. So because verses 12 to 14 are true, we should have that mindset about pressing on toward the goal. And Paul specifies two groups of people who should have this mindset, those who are mature and the rest. So first, let those of us who are spiritually mature think this way, means that those of us who are spiritually mature must have this mindset. This is a a similar idea to 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. That's the idea. Be infants in evil, and your thinking be mature. Our goal is to be mature in Christ, Colossians 1, 28. And then the other group is the second half of verse 15. It's the rest, the spiritually immature. If in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So those who are spiritually immature must also have this mindset. And Paul is confident that in due course, God will make that clear to the rest as well. So the answer to question four, who must have this mindset? The answer is both the spiritually mature and immature must have this mindset about pressing on toward the goal. Finally, question five, what must we do as we press on toward the goal? What must we do? Answers in verse 16. Let's read verse 16. Only... Let us hold true to, let us keep in step with what we have attained. What does that phrase mean, what we have attained? What does that refer to? It starts back in verses eight and nine. Uh, We've attained, excuse me, we have gained Christ or found in him because we have the righteousness from God, justification through faith. Then what we have attained includes any progress that we've made in the Christian life. We must hold on to the progress we've already made. In other words, don't lose ground. Don't go backwards. Live consistently in line with the truth you've already received. So question five, what must we do as we press on toward the goal? The answer is hold on to the progress we have already made. Hold on to the progress we've already made. If you're running a race, don't go backwards. Don't lose ground as you press on. If you're climbing the mountain, don't slide down the mountainside. Maintain your ground as you climb upwards. If you're climbing a rope, don't slip down the rope. Maintain your gains as you pull upwards. After God rescued the Israelites from Egyptian slavery in the Exodus, some of the Israelites in the wilderness grumbled and complained that they had it better back in Egypt. They wanted to go backwards but God brought them into the promised land. After Peter betrayed Jesus three times, he went backwards. He returned to fishing, went further backwards. But Jesus brought him back to lead the church. So don't follow their example of losing ground, don't go backwards, but do follow their example of getting up and pressing on. If you trip or stumble, don't despair. The godly may trip seven times, but they'll get up again. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. It's Proverbs 24, 16, Psalm 37, 24. So as we conclude this sermon, I'd like to address two groups of people. First, I'd like to address those who do not follow Christ. Maybe you're wondering, I don't think I'm even in this race you're talking about. I I don't think I'm following Christ as my king. Well, friend, if that's you, I implore you, on behalf of Christ the King, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. So if you have any questions about following Christ, I invite you to talk to any of the members of this church. That would be a pleasure. You might think it, it, it's awkward to talk to other people about God and sin and God's wrath and his love through Christ, but we don't think it's awkward. We love it. We love it. Uh, it's the good news that brings us all together, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds and different ages and ethnicities with different hobbies. Christ Jesus has made us his own. He's pursued and possessed us, and we'd love to tell you about it. And now I'd like to address another group of people. I'd like to address those who are already following Christ, those who are already in this race that Paul describes in Philippians 3. 
I began the sermon by telling you about how difficult it is to become a Navy SEAL. It requires sacrifice and single-mindedness, and that illustrates the principle that if you want to achieve an unusually difficult goal, you must sacrifice and be single-minded. You must press on toward the goal. That's the mindset Christians must have. So I exhort you on the basis of Philippians 3, what God writes here, sacrifice and be single-minded as you press on toward the goal, the finish line when you'll be like Christ. Press on toward the goal. When I say that, when I exhort you to be sacrificing and single-minded and pressing on, you might be thinking of some excuses like, I'm not an elite runner spiritually. I'm just average. I'm just normal or maybe below average and I can't possibly run any faster than I'm already running. You feel like that? Let me encourage you with a couple thoughts here. First, God calls you to run your race, the race he has designed particularly for you. God didn't call you to run my race or someone else's race. You're not competing with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We're a team, we're a family. We're not competing against each other. And God designed your race just for you, taking into account all your circumstances, all the ways he has gifted you. So that's one thought. Another encouraging thought is this. Are you sure about that, that you can't run any faster? Are you sure that you couldn't possibly press on toward the goal with any greater focus or effort? I'd like to encourage you with a little story from my favorite book in C.S. Lewis's Narnia series, Horse and His Boy, The Horse and His Boy. Now, I don't have the time to set the scene here, but there's an exciting part of the story when two Narnian war horses are running ahead of an evil invading army. And Lewis makes this comment as the narrator. Certainly, both horses were doing, if not all they could, all they thought they could, which is not quite the same thing. And then a, a lion suddenly begins to chase them. The horses are terrified of lions, particularly this lion, which had frightened them before. And then Lewis describes the war horse named Bree. His eyes gleamed red and his ears lay flat back on his skull. And Bree now discovered that he had not really been going as fast, not quite as fast as he could. Shasta, that's the writer, felt the change at once. Now they were really going all out. I share that story with you to encourage you that running as fast as you think you can run is probably not the same thing as running as fast as you can run. So brothers and sisters, God calls us to press on toward the goal. I'm emphasizing this truth because that's the main point of our text. But don't forget that earlier in this very letter, Paul writes in 2, 12 to 13, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, which you could paraphrase as press on toward the goal. Why? For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So take heart that God enables you to press on toward the goal. God enables you to finish your course. God will enable you to cross the finish line and hear him say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. So let's press on toward that goal. Let's pray. Father, thank you that Christ Jesus has made us his own. Would you please give us grace to focus on one thing? Please help us press on toward the goal. Help us do that by forgetting what lies behind, by straining forward to what lies ahead. We long for Jesus to come back, for you to give us glorified bodies that are free from sin and sickness. Until we reach that finish, that finish line, please enable us to press on toward the goal. Amen.